And, and you know, the, 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 one of the things that I guess we've kind of danced around a little bit, but we really haven't talked about is this, this idea of avascular necrosis or AVN. Um, you know, I always, I struggle a little bit to explain this to patients. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to explain it to somebody who kind of understands medicine. It's another thing to explain it to somebody who may not have really any grasp of it. Jan, how do you explain AV, AVN or avascular necrosis and in regards to the talus? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's difficult. You, you're, you're correct. I just say the damage was done at the time of the, you know, most of the damage is done at the time of the injury. Um, some of it's obviously done by in, in surgery as well. And I just say it's a loss of blood supply. And, you know, the bone is a living organ, just like anything else. And when it loses blood supply, unfortunately, it suffers. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the AVN, avascular necrosis, I, I talked about it early on. The blood supply is tenuous. There's, you know, a, not a, a lot of extra soft tissue attachments like you might have to, for like example, would be the calcaneus. It has a big, you know, a lot of periosteum, a, a big thick soft tissue attachments. The talus is, has no tendon attachments to it. It has a, a little bit of ligamentous and it's mostly articular cartilage. So um, it, it um, doesn't have that robust blood supply. And if the blood supply that it does have gets damaged, then the, 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 the bone itself basically goes through this necrotic necrosis process. And sometimes I'll explain it as kind of an advanced form of arthritis uh, that can happen as a result of the trauma to the, to the blood vessels. And, and usually the question is, well, why can't you just go in there and you know, improve the blood supply? And it, <laughs> that's always a little bit hard to explain, but it, you know, it's, a, it's always a little bit of a round and round uh, discussion, it seems like. So the point being, though, you know, when when we talk about like the femoral neck, because I think everybody is maybe, you know, as familiar with avascular necrosis in the femoral neck, that, you know, if you have a femoral neck fracture, you fix it as soon as possible. And at least in the talus, that doesn't seem to be as big a deal. And this is the paper that Jan was talking about, where basically taking type two fractures. And if you take this injury here, which has a displaced femoral uh, almost said femoral neck, a, a displaced Taylor neck fracture and a sublux subtalar joint. And here you have its dislocated subtalar joint. You know, these used to be classified as the same as the same thing. And what they basically found was that these oftentimes, you know, did not necessarily need to go to the OR emergently, but you did need to get them reduced. And that, that seemed to be important um, for preventing the risk of developing uh, avascular necrosis. Um, Jan, when, what do you tell patients in terms of their risk of developing avascular necrosis? Yeah. So, you know, I tell them it's similar to the hip data. At least I, I give, I quote them the same type of data, though it's, um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's different, but you can develop avascular necrosis at any time. So that can be an early uh, risk uh, or even later at a couple, you know, two to five years. I think it's been reported at the most five years after trauma. Um, so I tell them, you know, the highest risk is in the beginning. And then, but, you know, we may not know for some time. And, you know, I tell every patient with this type of fracture that they will develop arthritis. We just can't predict, you know, how much or when they will. And so I, just to give them like a heads up, if they start having pain, you know, you discharge them from your clinic a year out or six months out, uh, that if they start having pain, there might be something going on. Because I've seen sometimes you know, you put hardware in the talus and then everything looks great. And at six months or a year or two years later, they come back and there's uh, been collapse and the screws are protruding through the talus. Yep. Yeah, it, it's a very humbling injury. Uh, that's for sure. So osteonecrosis is probably the biggest thing that we would face, wouldn't you say, Jan? the loss of blood supply, the avascular necrosis. Yeah, and arthritis. I'd say arthritis. those are the two risks, I, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and this is, again, just kind of bringing home the point that, we, you know, don't necessarily need urgent, uh, that we need to urgently reduce the dislocations. And then we have a little bit more flexibility with um, when the timing is for fixing things. So the, the time that does matter is reduction of dislocated joints. If there's an open injury, obviously if there's tenting of skin, 
And the time to fixing these with rigid internal fixation, like we like we're going to talk about here in a second, is probably a little less important. Did you agree with that, Jan? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think we're learning that more and more, right? It's it's probably the quality of what we're doing as opposed to always the timing. Yeah. Um, so Jan touched on this already, and you probably don't need to know this, but this is kind of what we would teach the residents that you know the type two B, we want complete muscle relaxation. You want to flex the knee, and that takes attention off the gas rock and soleus, and then counterflex the ankle, and then some distraction. And at least in this case, we were able to get a successful reduction of the subtalar joint, just like Jan implied. Um, you know, Hawkins three, and I, I talked about these before, but that's where the body, Taylor body gets uh, dislocated and oftentimes going posterior medial. Kind of interesting, you know, this is a case of a posterior medial dislocation. You can see the big toe um, is flexed. Um, I hope I can find it here. So you see how it's kind of flexed down here. And, and that's a finding because you you the Taylor body goes posterior medial and it pushes on tensions at FHL. And so it uh, you know can basically uh, be kind of a sign, you know, when you see this person in the ER of, of what's going on there. Um, any tips for open reduction? Because sometimes these don't want to reduce open. Do you have any any tips that you use for uh, managing these? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with, I do make two approaches always. I do an anterior lateral and anterior medial. Um, if I'm going to open reduce this, if it's not. It, what about, what, what about just a dislocation? Let's say it's a, a three, Hawkins three in the body's posterior medial. Yeah. So I try to do it closed, mm -hmm. um, you know, full muscle relaxation in the operating room, you know, under fluoro. I've been sometimes successful and then I'll use, I'll try to use a joystick. I try not to do this. I try to reduce it before I fix it because it's a big procedure. And so I don't want to be, you know, usually these come in the middle of the night. So I don't want to be fixing this in the middle of the night. Yeah. So I will try to use a joystick or something, even if a, uh, X fix just to get distraction and then try to get it just, you know, in a better place. And, you know, you have to be careful about the neurovascular bundle and so forth, but I think K wires and joysticks can be very helpful. Yeah. And this is just a technique paper and it might be helpful to have, you know, where you might get called in, um, in the middle of the night is if, you know, they're putting an X fix on, cause I think that that is becoming more commonplace. Um, are you doing a medially based X fix if you do one, or are you doing a standard Delta or how are you, how would you how would you X fix something like this? Usually I'm just doing a standard Delta um, mm -hmm. frame and a standard Delta frame, just for everybody on the call is usually it's, it, it's a standard ankle frame, two pins in the two half pins in the tibia and usually a medial to lateral calcaneal pin. Um, like as a chance, you know, maybe a five millimeter pin or sometimes I think some systems are six through the calcaneus. And it just, it gives you more, I think, traction to use just that type yeah. of pin. Allows the soft someone, tissue to rest a little bit. Yeah, and someone asked, "What size chance pin will you typically use the joystick?" And, and uh, David, that's a. It depends on a, how what one is what size the piece is, and you know I'll usually try to start small, um, and use some type of like three or four millimeter pin. But if sometimes it's like you you, it's more difficult, or the pin pulls out depending on the uh, the bone quality of the patient and the comminution that's already present so it but usually start small three to four because you can always go bigger and you know sometimes it's just a little bit of manipulation and you can get it uh, reduced and, and that's if I'm doing it close if I'm doing it open I'm using like a one six or two okay wire just to kind of um and usually two or three of them to kind of just be able to you know move that move the fragments around um, before I uh, fixate them. So if you have to, if you have to open this, say, um, are you going to go like it, it, this, at least this, this one describes coming using the anterolateral approach. Yes. And, you know, I think that makes some sense. You know, sometimes you get soft tissue in repose. Sometimes it buttonholes through the capsule. Um, is that, is that how you're approaching it? Or are you going posterior medial? I've heard people talk about doing that. What, what's your approach incision-wise? If I'm gonna fix it, I'm gonna do two approaches. So I just do two approaches off the bat. Right out the gate. So then you're, if you have to open it to reduce it, you're gonna fix it that night or you're just gonna- No, I mean, I'll do everything I can to try not <laughs> to open it. Okay. If I'm opening it, I'm fixing it. 
Okay. That's, that's my question. You know, is yeah. it, is if you're, you know, if you're, if you have to open that up, kind of being prepared to fix it. And so for yeah. those on the call, I think, you know, thinking through that process that if you are going to the OR and they're like, Hey, it's just, it's, it's a dislocated Taylor head. We're just going to put an X fix on maybe thinking in the back of your mind. Well, if we open it, there could be other trauma surgeons or foot and ankle surgeons who are comfortable fixing this and say, if I'm opening it, I'm fixing it. And now you want to have your tool set, your toolkit ready to go um, in that scenario. And we'll talk about what that looks like here in a second. 